Good morning from Paris and good evening to those of you in Asia. My name is Serge Dumont and I am the chairman of the board of trustees of Asia Society France. I am delighted to chair this panel entitled Solutions for an Impact-Led Recovery. More than two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, we have now seen the devastating public health and economic disruption an, econo an, an epidemic can cause on a global scale. The impact of COVID-19 on Asia has been considerable. And this matters as some of the most vulnerable populations live in Asia, the most populous continent with over 60% of the world's population and its economy growth engine. We saw how the private sector stepped up to the plate and in many instances was instrumental in the COVID-19 response from testing to the rapid development of new types of vaccine and the continued supply of goods and services under extremely challenging conditions. And importantly, more and more companies are seizing the moment to realign profit with social and environmental impact. We are here today, <clears throat> excuse me, with a wide range of panelists and expertise on stage to discuss their views and insights on what opportunities were found amidst adversity and what lessons can be learned and how impact-led investing can better shape a response and recovery in Asia. If Marina join us, this is a remarkably diverse panel. First, as I mentioned, if she joins us, we have a balanced, a gender balanced panel, something that is really dear to me. And while we do not have a representative from an Asian company, all panelists have a wealth of experience in global issues and Asia. Our panelists are Calvin de Souza, Associate Managing Director, Kroll Canada, Christine Costier, Chief Executive Officer, GEN Partners, the Netherlands, Blessing I Am Here, Chief Executive Officer, Umugini Pipeline Infrastructure, Nigeria, and possibly Marina Shmatova, member of the Scientific Council, Financial University under the government of the Russian Federation. You have their bios, so I will not elaborate on their background and will, without further ado, invite each panelist to speak for roughly five minutes before we discuss as a group. I will first turn to Calvin, who has lived in Asia from Mumbai to Singapore. Calvin, we have seen a major shift in Asia Pacific, where investment in ESG has accelerated massively recently. Can you tell us whether Asian companies leading the regeneration of the continent will be those that are more focused on impact investing principles? And can you give us your basic definition of impact investing and how it may differ in Asia from more mature markets? Thanks, Serge, and a pleasure to be on this panel with everyone today. Um, from a perspective of defining impact investing, I go back to the original definition, you know, coined by the Rockefeller Foundation, which over the years has changed a bit. Broadly, I would say that impact investing is defined by the intention to generate both financial returns, but also a measurable and tangible social and environmental impact. Now, the reason I sort of say measurable and tangible with, with, you know, with, a, with a bit of a caveat there is particularly in Asia, I think the definition of impact investing is one that is still very much in evolving. Um, more generally in Asia, impact investing as an industry, I would define as being more nascent than, than a developed market, let's say Europe or North America. Uh, for example, you know, recent surveys from just prior to the pandemic suggested that in terms of actual impact capital, you could argue that, you know, in Asia, we're still in sort of the single figures as a potential percentage of global impact capital. Now, the the difference being is, is that in Asia, you're starting from a sort of lower base. So there's a lot more room to grow in terms of impact capital. And you could argue a lot more challenges 
that impact capital could actually have room to service. Now, um, when we sort of started, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, in terms of sort of how impact capital has changed, there's been a, it, been a very, very fast growth in the amount of impact capital that kind of has gone into the Asian market. In the past, one would say that Asian investors sort of saw investing very much in a kind of binary black and white manner where you had for-profit investing and not-for-profit. There was not a clear demarcation or not nuance, you could argue, in businesses being both aligned to generating financial impact or generating sort of social impact, whereas, you know, you could argue in North America, a number of businesses are very much trained into sort of having an ESG lens. Now, what I think is is sort of, you know, I mean, I'll go into sort of, you know, what, what, what was sort of an older issue in Asia is that a number of investors cited a mixture of unfavorable and uncertain regulatory in, environments into kind of coming towards a more coherent and uniform definition about what impact investing is. So, for example, two things, you, you would have, say, different regulations or a different framework developed by a Singaporean monetary authority compared to a Hong Kong monetary authority in terms, in terms of what an ESG reporting looked like. Or Okay, I just lost you, Calvin. You just froze. Hmm. Let's let's give him a minute to to join again. And welcome, Marina. We're delighted to have you. Can you say a few words so we can see if we can hear you? In yeah, yeah, regulations yeah, yeah. like the PRI were more widely let's just, let's accepted. Um, and 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 more differently as well. I think what impact investing in asia uh also kind of kind of was a bit different was a bit different is that you had a number of institutions like the world bank or the adb which had very kind of you know operated more from a social lens and less private investors who are, you know who had that financial and social lens and sort of were able to combine it the other big difference i think that asia has compared to a number of other uh, businesses and say again, you know, the, the more you know, the more kind of established world is the intricacy of family networks and family businesses, uh, and that difference is kind of important in terms of you know how you have uh, how you sort of structure impact investing. Now, looking forward in terms of what we can expect post pandemic, I think there's a lot more opportunity in terms of Asia. Um, in terms of how the next generation of investors or private businesses will unfold. Now, the reason we say that is two things, two or, or a few things here, and I'll just kind of briefly touch upon them. Firstly, you're going to have to see there is a vaster generational shift happening in Asia because of a, you know, a, a, a bigger chunk of the population being under 30 or under 35. This will definitely see a similar value shift in terms of digitization, also an increased in i guess acceptance but also interest in ESG issues amongst younger people um, and and in your you know you're similarly seeing sort of supply chains in most parts of the world now green, greening or greenifying an increased focus in people wanting to kind of you know take climate change more seriously um, as well as kind of invest in businesses of the future. South Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia particularly has a bigger imperative, for example, to green its supply chain. Many countries across the region will face a lot more of the devastating effects of climate change. Similarly, you have a number of kind of countries where the state or governments are very cash strapped. So, you're not going to have a situation where governments can kind of step in to sort of assist various sectors um, across the country. So you're going to need the private se the sector to play a more historic, you know, more kind of forward thinking role in investments, whether it be in, you know, in renewable energy, in green buildings, uh, even in infrastructure, you're going to need sort of the private sector to kind of come in. And so I think here, 
here you're going to basically have in Asia two broad thrusts. You're going to have, you know, big multinational enterprises. I can cite, for example, Unilever or Samsung, which are both looking to kind of move into sort of certifying their supply chains or certifying, you know, the, the, the types of material that's used in their buildings. And then you're going to also have, you know, more local or smaller scale um, companies in Asia that will that will require funding. So we're talking about kind of small and medium term, medium sized enterprises that are looking to both be in, you know, both generate a profit, but also offer solutions to the kind of problems that arise in sort of specific countries. So, for example, in India, you have so the, the need for greater energy independence. And so you have a lot of firms now in the in areas like solar energy or in sort of solutions that kind of help people to kind of access energy or banking, for example, in the villages. So there is a lot of area of growth. And I would say, uh, you know, just quote another couple of small, small statistics before we sort of move on here. Since COVID, a recent survey done by the MSCI, you know, global kind of framework of, sort of reg regulations, has stated that over... 80% of investors in Asia Pacific now cite ESG investments as being significantly or moderately impactful in their response to COVID. And over 60% of investors believe that they have to completely or to a large extent incorporate ESG in their decision making in their investments in Asia. This is a kind of a completely big shift to pre-pandemic. Where, a fo where, where you had just a focus on profit or you had a very social enterprise focus. So to kind of, kind of long story short, there is a, a vast, there is vast room for growth in terms of impact investment in Asia. It is still very nascent in terms of regulations, but in future, most businesses and enterprises will have to focus very much on ESG as well as profit. I'll turn that back to you now, Serge. Thank you so much, Calvin. And I'm now going to invite Christine, who comes at it from a, a very different point of view. Uh, Christine, you're really familiar with Asia. You've lived in Indonesia. And I know that you look at this situation from an entirely different lens, that of people with a particular emphasis on diversity. So can you give us uh, your take on whether impact investing will play a greater role in the Asian recovery? And tell us in particular what you see as the role of women. Thank you, Shared. And um, lovely first introduction. There is so much to learn, right? And um, I want to start off with um, being honored to be on this panel. I think indeed that we have a lot of Asian expertise, perhaps. Um, but I also would like to state that I'm not an Asian expert. In my platform, um, we always say we work as globalists. And that includes, yes, uh, having been lived in um, Indonesia, that was very, very interesting, of course, because it helps you to translate any latest situation in your life. Um, and when you work in Asia, uh, we have had an office in Singapore. We have done a lot of work for boards. And there we already come into that sphere of strategic talent and especially of um, yeah, balancing diversity in thinking is what we call it. And for that, we have done for we follow often um, with my platform the legislation and regulation to just give you a simple um, example and statistic how how we can impact the <laughs> impact thinkers, right? Uh, when a law changed and so regulation and legislation changed in Malaysia several years ago. Uh, we were honored to work together with groups that then led over 1,300 well-qualified, of course, um, um, feminine, I'm oh, sorry, female executives and experts through our training and certification and bring them much better positions into boards. And that's already one example, I would say, um, how, how through people we can work on what looks like and the 
investment or result driven social and socio eco outcomes. Now, if we talk about regeneration after this, well, we're still in this disruptive time. Let's be honest, it's not over yet. It's we are we have been shaken eh? and um, and the gap is still there. Now, to regenerate, I just want to say in our eyes from strategic talent uh, level and integrative um, cancellations, management, well, we can use old terms, new terms, but we're busy with people and moving companies forward, mostly in the public sector. And we love family works. And for example, one thing I will never forget what I learned when I lived in Indonesia, you know, was maybe the second step in my career. And to learn about the bamboo network of the Chinese people, you know, and living in, in, in Indonesia itself was like eye-opening. Very, very interesting. Now, regeneration to me means learning new models, um, thinking about new strategies. And what is key in our eyes is that the old establishments, wherever on the world, is open to acknowledge and accept that there are people, shakers and movers, big or small, corporate or non-corporate, um, public, non-public, um, that have been putting the effort in not only setting new standards, but also the effort to accept the fact that the new is being built on the old. We, we built already in 2000, it was very clear after the global financial crisis, it was very clear that we would be all building on the new, on the old. Well, we didn't learn enough, did we? So now we get shaken again. We are, and I think that is to non-dispute of anyone, we are in, in, in the energy where, where the feminine principle comes more to life. And, and in this respect for impact, let's go to investing then. In my circles, what we see is very strong gathering and, and new models and, and new circles from yin investors. I find it such a fun terror. Don't you think so? Yin investors. So the female investors. What is They're it? Fantastic. It's yin Yang, right? Yin Yang from Yin Yang. And uh, they pop up everywhere, very strong circles. And how are they connected? They are connected often globally. So we don't think the local global anymore. And we, we are just thinking in that global circle because this is a very simple statistic, you know. Ladies that want women, specialists and executives and investors that want to meet each other need to stretch out a little bit further to see each other. So that is what we see. And then we work through the... What, what we call the feminine principle and I think maybe later we can I can elaborate a little bit on that and what I see in connection with this you know so um, impact led regeneration of Asia I, of course there is a lot of pain in Asia as there is elsewhere in the world maybe it's more disguised or you know and um, maybe it's less raw but it is there so I always believe I have never believed so much in the pendulum Right where we, when we were uh, studying, we were told that right we go east, we go west. Now the disruptions are way deeper, and will be fixed. Need to be fixed faster than ever before. However, anything that we do, what I think can be sustainable, needs to be scalable. And there is my other question for the discussion: How global forces, cultural. Um, tinted, eh, colored, do you think um, impact investments on the level that we talk about really is? And then furthermore, I think, you know, to really be successful in anything that we do, that's also how we see our work, our emotional work very often eh, with, with the very high level investors and their families. You know, you need to be prepared to not only be a starter but also be a finisher and meaning that you need to deliver impact, stay close with your investment throughout the investment life cycle. And last but not least for the balance, I just did, I love this in my work. I love to work with very high level uh, size doesn't matter any size shape and form but also sometimes look just in your small circle around you, 
there can also be impact investments. Thank and that you. is one thing also for Asia. It's not all that seen as much as what we put out here in the West. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. You've raised a lot of, of issues and interesting points, as well as Calvin. We'll continue in the, in the group discussion. I would like to invite Blessing now to say a few words. And, and, and Blessing, you come at it from an entirely different perspective, given your background in infrastructure. And as an African whose continent uh, has seen the links with Asia develop significantly over the last couple of decades. Can you give us your point of view on the role of impact investment and how it will play in the recovery? Blessing. Thank you, Sobo Sej, and um, good morning to every member of the panel and all joining today. It's quite a pleasure to be here um, discussing um, solutions to impact-led recovery. I must thank um, Kevin and Christine for laying a very solid foundation and driving us with, with uh, provocative thoughts as to, to this. Starting from me, um, I will say I've not um, lived in Asia, um, neither do I, have a bus do I have business in Asia. I live in Africa and I do business in Africa. However, I have had reasons to partner and to do business with um, Asia companies and I know um, to a very large extent the commitment and the focus that some of these companies do have in terms of you know, their investment and driving towards the impact side of investment. I think from my perspective, I will share, given that there is huge similarity between Asia and Africa in terms of population, uh, in terms of um, demography and, and all that. So I will use my company and my understanding of the Africa market as a case study, you know, of, of what I think that um, the Asia uh, firms and entities can do as well. I think we all know, um, Kevin did allude to this as well as Christine, the effect of the pandemic has been very devastating on everybody across the world. And Asia is not spared from that at all. So the focus of government has been recovery, all right? How do we survive? How do we survive the pandemic? And what has this done? It has created gaps, all right? Instead of focusing on things like infrastructure, focusing on elevation of poverty, reduction of poverty, creating other infrastructures, what we have, therefore, is focus and resources being channeled to how do we mitigate, you know, how do we survive the effect of the pandemic. And this impact is not going to go away overnight. Huge resources have been committed, gaps have been created. And so it means that for any government, especially in Asia, as we speak today, to recover from this and be able to still focus on those things that will impact the populace, you know, impact and affect the citizens going forward. There is need to think a different strategy. And I think that's where impact investing comes in here, where we need to, you know, encourage collaboration between the government and the private sector, all right? Where the government also need to recognize the fact that there is need for that partnership for us to deliver the dividends of governance. And that dividend of governance includes ensuring that the people are catered for, that will continue to reduce the impact of poverty on our people. We also continue to ensure that we create infrastructure that we enable people to unleash their potential and their talent. Okay? So before now, impact investing have been seen um, as a CSRO issue. So you invest in it, you don't look at return. But I think that has changed. Impact investing today is different. It's about focusing on sustainability and at the same time looking at returns. You are balancing both of them. You are looking at the effect of social impact. You are looking at environmental impact. At the same time as a business, you are looking at the return, you know, that you have on your investment. So in Nigeria, and especially in my organization, what are we doing? We are partnering with the government, we are partnering with the community, and we are partnering with all that key stakeholders to ensure that this impact investment is, you know, um, not just what we say, 
but we are practically doing it. So I operate in the energy sector and we need community engagement and what we call license to operate. The reason is because we operate in communities and our operation have the potential to negatively impact the environment. All right? Because... <laughs> and they have been challenged. Companies have Oh. Can you hear me? Am I am I audible? Oh, beautiful. Uh, sorry for that. Okay, so what we do, therefore, is to ensure that there is partnership, all right, with the environment. In terms of environment, are you going to finish your business and go away and the people don't have life to live again? They don't have, you know, sustainable, sustainable uh, means of livelihood? No. We, as we do our business, we are mindful of the fact that the environment must be preserved. And so the issue of energy efficiency is in the forefront of our business. The issue as well of the impact on climate issue is also being considered. We are also careful and mindful of the carbon emission that our, that our, that our operation you know, creates in the environment, in the society. Is it hazardous? Can people live in the environment? Can people, you know, um, do their normal um, businesses because we are operating there or in spite of the fact that we are operating there? We also look at the issue of waste. Our operation generates a lot of waste. How are we managing that? So we are profitable business. We are private business. But however, we cannot run after profitability at the expense of sustainability. All right? So we have to balance profitability and sustainability okay and sustainability doesn't mean that you you don't need to do make profit no make profit but to do this i will say three things number one we are intentional about our actions and this is the same thing i will say to my asia um businesses today we must be intentional about our businesses we must be intentional about our profitability the same thing intentional about the impact of our business on our environment. It has to be deliberate. We have to look at that. We must also focus on returns. However, in focusing on returns, it should not be short-term returns. We must focus on return on the short-term, on the medium-term, and the long-term. Because if we can balance this, then we are able, you know, to put those together very well. Our strategy, you know, for this will be okay. And lastly, uh, it's like my time is runs up. And lastly, I will talk about measurable, you know, indices, you know, for impact investing. How are we measuring? How are we reporting, you know, the, our operation in terms of ESG? Are we reporting properly? All right. Are we disclosing them? And I'm, I, I know that there are companies in Africa today like um, Risk Insight um, that are measuring ESG issues on, on Africa businesses. So there are templates that people are using today to measure those ones. So we must be able to also measure. Thank you so much, um, um, Serge and everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Marina, we're going to give you welcome again. I'm glad you could make it. Uh, we're, we're going to ask you to be short so we can have a conversation with uh, the group and invite questions. Um, you, you come from an entirely different perspective, the Russian. And you have a significant experience in impact investment in both South Africa and Central Asia. So can you share your views based on that experience? Oh, nice to see you all. Thank you, Serge. And I would like to share with you my recent experience and how the COVID pandemic has impacted investments and what lessons investors should learn and what new strategy for sensible investing should be. For last two years, I was involved in investment development in Mozambique. We implemented a number of best to energy projects and created an industrial park and, car and carried our several um, other infrastructure projects. Analyzing the country's potential, which is the most or less typical of the entire African uh, continent, we saw limitations 
in the cotton sector during the pandemic. And previously, raw cotton was uh, exported in Asia, China, Bangladesh, and many other countries, and processed there up to the final product, which was uh, imported into Africa for consumption. This this is the whole variety of cotton of, of cotton products including clothing and uniform, underwear, many other cotton products, including ever medicine, absorbent cotton, and another. And this business model was traced in its own uh, direction. Raw materials were exported and processed in other countries and, re and returned in the form of expensive product. Surprisingly enough, the situation with the world pandemic made all economics look more seriously at the possibility of their uh, countries and begin to strengthen the, the practicing of all kinds of raw materials inside the country. Our corporation decided to uh, optimize the cotton value here locally and they took me to Asia, uh, particularly to Uzbekistan where an integrated cotton value chair was uh, recently implemented, implemented as an as, as an, um, national cotton cluster policy and this experience has been very successful and has created sustainability and is one of the good examples of impact investors. And I have seen that the most optim optimal investment and value um, indeed given the pandemic situation is the development of faster economic within countries. Moreover, it allowed job and allows jobs and education and housing for families as all uh, segments of the population uh, I involved I it. Uh, and this is the case when impact investment is uh, fully traceable throughout the entire part of, of its development and the development of the economic within the project and the country and the serious social impact. Cluster uh, of the model is impact investment as a sustainable development. Uh, integrated cluster project requires reasonable combination of the transport logistics, energy supply, capacity building and education, development of social infrastructure, housing, health and care, and then all. And our company has signed a number of cluster development projects in Uzbekistan, and next year we will transfer uh, this experience to Africa, uh, in South Africa countries, whenever. And we have uh, also agreed to open the university in Uzbekistan, where we will turn to specialists, specialists specifically for the uh, form of cluster operation parts. And uh, it's my, this is my uh, experience in the impact investment in, uh, in Asia and in Africa too. It's, uh, e and, and we can trust this experience for another directly. Thank you for your attention and hope you a long team cooperation and friendly and friendly. Thank you so much, Marina. I think what we'll do now is uh, if we can get blessing online again, is to have uh, more of a group discussion. A lot of very good points have been raised. Uh, and from my perspective, one point uh, has really struck me during this crisis is the question of profit versus social good. And so inequity in terms of access to the vaccine. 70% of the population in the, the developed countries uh, is vaccinated versus roughly 5% in the rest. Access to, uh, to um, oxygen tanks or hospital beds. So how can we do better? Can you please elaborate on that from your perspective? A question for me? Question for everybody. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Calvin? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, um, just very quickly, I, I think the, the particularly the nature, of, uh, you, you bring up vaccination as an issue. In so many ways, the pandemic has meant that a lot of the strides forward 
in terms of poverty or alleviation have ceased for a moment. The pandemic has kind of demonstrated vast inequalities in countries. And I think compared to a lot of countries in the more developed world, again, you have a number of Asian governments which aren't able to fill in the same vacuum in terms of deficit spending or, I mean, general spending to kind of alleviate poverty and, and you know, and improve infrastructure. So again, how we do better is probably a mixture of public-private partnerships. Again, you need to attract investor funding in any way um, and basically marry that imperative with social purpose. So whether it's in the form of kind of, you know, generation of, of, of things like vaccines, better health care, infrastructure dev- development, um, and even, you know, environmental issues. So I think going forward, most most sort of Asian economies will look to this private-public partnership to help in sort of, you know, bringing Asian countries back to where they were before. Uh, I, I know, Christine, you want to say something, but before you do so, I'd like to welcome anybody from uh, the audience to ask questions. If you want to do so, you have a little microphone at the bottom. If you go grab the mic. You just grab it, and I'll let you ask your question. So if anybody wants to do it, you can do it now. Otherwise, whoever wants, I believe, Christine wanted to say something, I read you that. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have a question from the floor. Go ahead. There's a question from Valérie Terranova. Go ahead and ask your question. We cannot hear you, Valérie. Yeah, we can we can see you, we cannot hear you. Valérie, the unmute unmute button is next to the mic button. So you have to unmute yourself, Valérie. Uh, well, there is nothing I can do. Try, try again. All right, let's uh, let's move on to to Christine and then Valerie. Whenever you can, you'll be welcome to ask your question. And if you want, Valerie, you can send me a, a text message, uh, and I'll uh, I'll answer the question. I'll ask the question for you, hmm. Christine. I think, Sergi, the point that you raised about in, in inequality is so super important. And then and the, the point that you raised about um, MPPPs, uh, public-private partnerships, and that in combination with impact at, um, impact investing may may yeah demonstrate to be a bit risk risky still for both parties, perhaps, and for the governmental parties and the public parties. Um, and here I come with my and with what we we call with my term the feminine principle, where and that is not only for females, of course. It's it's the it's the, the outbalancing masculine and feminine models, even as where linearity is often seen as the masculine principle. Circularity is another very important word in this in this context. I think circular circular economies. It's often seen as the feminine organizing principle. Now, inclusion, nurturing, trust, integrative are all words that fit in that container. Now, how to bring that to the fore in combination with the public bodies and the private bodies, I think is still quite a way to go. And then I come back to the scalability and search. I also come back to what I actually think that sometimes more regional or local projects, even with risky things like vaccination, should always be integrated in the in the complete focus of regeneration and there you can see that new models can fit in you know it's not only the the macro um, effect that you're looking for sometimes it's for the micro effect as well Um, anything out there for others to jump on this wave please well I'd I'd like to ask a question maybe and then uh, let you. you you raise an interesting question and Calvin mentioned 
the major shift that is the generational shift that is happening yeah. in Asia. In fact, this is true in Africa as well. But when, when you look at the board of companies, there is a, a, an amazing lack of diversity. And it is not just gender diversity. We've no. made some progress, but it is not enough to get there. But it is the diversity in thinking, in backgrounds, in ethnicity, uh, really having a worldview. Uh, I see a lot of American boards, they have some gender diversity, but everybody uh, has been you know, brought up in the United States and, and their worldview is, naturally leads to groupthink. Uh, so how, are, you know, how can we change that? And are we actually prepared to deal with a massive generational shift that is happening with the consequences that it will have, some of them obviously positive, with an increased interest in ESG uh, in particular. So would you like, would any of you like to address this point? I only want to throw in the basket for anyone uh, the term trust, because can we cope with it? With how, how are we going to deal with it? And how really global is the next generation? How much support do they get? So there is the old establishment versus the new. And can we, can we jump off roadblocks that we have created ourselves? Well, only with, of course, a lot of effort. And also, as I said before, by holding hands and making, making sure for both generations that we cannot do it alone. If we organize retreats for high level, whatever, it doesn't matter. We always make sure that there are two generations so we can learn from each other. But trust versus time, Serge, I think that is a, a, a big key to bring in new models and new backgrounds, new context, whilst not ignoring, um, excluding all that has been built. So respect, trust and respect is very close to each other. I would just add a very quick point, Serge, about the, the demographic shift. So once you start having a, a, a huge number of the population now, you know, say in their 30s or 20s, and you start lifting a large number of these people out of poverty, you then also have people now demanding more in terms of, you know, better access to, say, water, education, things like that, but also better better understanding of the manner in which the environment is used. So, you know, a better understanding of how supply chains are used to manufacture goods, um, a better reason to kind of, you know, just like in more developed countries, people will now sort of start demanding more impact in terms of investment. So with a change in demographic and further digitization, you're likely to get a further shift in Asia and perhaps a much faster shift in terms of how vastly integrated ESG and impact investing will become, in my opinion. Excellent. Let me... I, oh, you want to say something? Let's go ahead. Yeah, just to add to um, the conversation on, on this, um, diversity and inclusivity, I, I think the truth is, um, from where I sit and in Nigeria today, there are deliberate efforts being made by organizations to ensure this diversity. Diversity in terms of inclusion of females in the boards and top management roles, as well as being conscious of the involvement of millennials and younger people in decision making. Um, I think that is critical because we have larger population as young people. And so we cannot be making decisions that affect them without them being part of this. I think it's part of that conversation that everybody has to be there. And we have to be intentional about this. We must be intentional. And I think that is a strategy that companies and organizations should deploy. First of all, develop the strategy. Be deliberate about this is what we want to do. And the next thing is the structure. How do we include these people in ensuring that there is this diversity, whether female, whether young people, whether um, disabled people, everybody must be involved in this conversation. I, I could not agree more. And in fact, uh, a good example of people not being necessarily at the, at the table was the COP26, where the average, uh, the average age in the room was over 60, but the, the people that were making a lot of noise outside were much, much younger. So we mm -hmm. need to provide a seat at the table to everyone. 
We have a very interesting question from Valérie, but it is 12, and I've been told that I have to cut the session, so I am terribly sorry, we're running out of time. It's been a, a fascinating uh, and insightful discussion, and I want to thank Horace and uh, Frank, Jorgen, Richter uh, for inviting us, and I want to thank all of you for participating, and I want to thank in particular our panelists. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you all mm -hmm. very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Serge. Thank you. Thank you it's very much. Thank you, Serge, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Can Bye. Enjoy Granada. Bye. <laughs> Bye then. Bye.